I started my chemical training about 31 years ago, and for about 30 of those years, uh, I did chemistry in water, and uh, between zero and 100 degrees Celsius. And so when uh, Rusty came to me about a year ago and said, uh, let's see if we can do some chemistry in molten salts, that was uh, a new experience for me. And so I'm learning about uh, chemistry in molten salts, but I'm very excited about it and, and the, the, the possibilities. So this is uh, some of our group that uh, represents the next collaboration. Uh, 10 faculty and staff and about 20 or so undergraduate students, depending on the semester. It's an exciting place to be and to work. Several departments represented here. I appreciated uh, Sid's comments yesterday about the value of diversity on a research team. And uh, I, I now look forward to the next research meeting where I'm in the room with engineers and physicists and the chemists and computer scientists because it, it's, it's interesting to see how all of us approach problems from different perspectives and that's uh, really a value to me. <clears throat> I'm, I'm pleased with our uh, funding that allows me to have new toys to play with and uh, support for the time that I get to do the research. Um, the, the <clears throat> goal, one of the goals for our collaboration uh, is to build this non-nuclear test and research molten salt system. Uh, it's basically a reactor without the nuclear fuel, right? So um, the part about that that catches my eye is the word test. Uh, so we can use that to evaluate and demonstrate uh, emerging technologies. Okay, so what technologies? So as we look at the uh, Generation 4 International Forum uh, Technology Roadmap, as they discuss molten uh, salt reactor R&D, um, they point out areas like corrosion and uh, molten salt chemistry control, redox control, liquid-liquid extraction, salt purification. Now my training is as an analytical chemist, and so I see the world through glasses that are always showing me or asking me to look at what's in it and how much is there. What's in the salt and how much of whatever it is, is there. And so as I look at these problems that have been identified, you want to measure corrosion or understand corrosion, we need to understand uh, what's in the salt that's affecting the corrosion. Uh, for molten salt chemistry control, we need to understand what's in the salt uh, and down the list, redox, liquid-liquid extraction. When well, you want to pull something out of the liquid, we need to be able to measure what's left in the liquid. Uh, salt purification, why? Because of corrosion. Well, that means we need to have some ability to know what impurities are in the salt um, at all times, preferably. So that leads me to one inescapable conclusion, and this has become the dream of my work now. We need a direct chemical analysis of flowing molten salt. I want some system that we can plug into our salt loop or into your reactor someday that will tell us all the time, continuously, what's in the salt. Corrosion products, impurities, fission products, we want to know all the time what's in there. Uh, and I think that's uh, something important for us to pursue. Well, like I said, it's been a year or less since I've started working on this. I'm certainly not there. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, the presentation from Thomas uh, from uh, Copenhagen Atomics. It sounds like Libs is uh, getting close to being there. I'm excited about learning more about that. But uh, for us, right now, I'm working with what we've got. And so I come back to our um, team goals and I add my dream right under that. That's where I feel like I fit into this project of, uh, of finding a method for that direct chemical analysis of a flowing molten salt. Well, that's where we want to go. Here's where we are. So here's our first attempt at a, a flowing molten salt loop. Uh, you know, it doesn't look like much. We haven't dressed it up for Amazon yet, but uh, uh, <laughs> maybe someday we'll get to that point. But for us right now, a big part of this is to gain experience with the molten salt loop in a pumped flowing uh, loop. You know, there's, there's a whole lot to be learned when you go from a flowing liquid like water at less than 100 degrees to a molten salt at 200 or more degrees. 
Uh, and, and that's an area that most of us have not experienced before working on this project. And so there's a lot for us to learn. And so we're taking some baby steps. For example, we're using Dynalene MS2, which is a nitrate salt. And we chose that because it has a very low melting point among the salts. It allows us to start at a low range, make sure we can do that safely, and then work our way up. It has a fairly good corrosion performance, so we hope it's not going to eat through our pipes on the first couple of days. Um, and maybe we, there are some things we can learn about just handling a molten salt. Uh, and so our system has a capacity of about 19 liters. Uh, that's about 35 kilograms of salt that we loaded into there. This is a picture from an infrared camera looking at the loop and uh, you can see the exposed heat tape that uh, is, is glowing bright uh, white. Uh, and then there's other places where the heat tape is covered by aluminum foil and you can't see that quite as much. But the point is this thing is really hot and a lot hotter than most of the beakers that I'm used to working with. And so as I want to go over there and pull salt samples out, they tell me I have to dress up in some funny space suit so that I don't hurt myself. And uh, well, that brings new uh, interesting challenges as well. You know, it's kind of difficult to uh, operate the uh, fine motor skills with these big bulky gloves on. And uh, that, that little hat that I was supposed to wear, uh, you know, there's no oxygen supply in there. So if I'm not done in about 10 minutes, I start breathing really fast. And uh, anyway, so there's all kinds of new challenges. I'm not sure we really have to have that yet, but maybe when we're working with fluoride salts at five or 600 degrees, that'll probably become really important. So there's a lot to learn and we're off to a, a good start. So one of the things we wanted to do in this system first was uh, after we melt the salt, can we, can we pull samples out of it? I mean, it seems like a no brainer, but I've never done that before. So we had to figure out a way to do that. So we built a little uh, stainless steel cup and uh, welded it onto a stick. And, and so we just dipped that little cup down into the vat of uh, molten salt. And we pull it up and we've got a sample. Okay, we can work with that. Um, another thing we, we wanted to be able to do was just simply to figure out how much salt is in there. We know how much we put in there, but what's the salt level? And so we came up with an idea for a threaded rod. We just stick the threaded rod down in there and pull it back out and maybe it sticks. Well, it, actually it sticks really, really well to the threaded rod. In fact, that's a, not a bad way to sample the salt. You've got to kind of ch ch chip it off of there, but uh, you can pull lots of good salt sample out. Now this is a little bit more elegant way and you really can't see it so I'm going to advance one more and now you can see, see if I can point here is the, uh, the the main line of the salt loop coming up from the the uh, bucket down below uh, and then in red here is our sampling T there's a valve here and then this little small tube is where the salt comes out so this was built in there and we tried it with hot water, but uh, nobody knows what, what's gonna happen when we open the valve and allow the salt to flow through under pressure. And so I'm wearing the big suit and we've got the, uh, uh, the heat tape around all that thing so that the salt doesn't freeze up as it comes out. And uh, so we open the valve and count to three and close the valve and lo and behold, there's some salt in the bottom of the bucket and we've sampled salt from a flowing loop. All right, so we've accomplished, those are some major goals that we've accomplished for ourselves. They're not publishable, but it's something that we had to go through to get to the next steps. But there's certainly some significant problems here, right? Uh, if, if I really want to know if there's impurities in the salt, like water and oxygen, then I have to be able to sample without exposing the sample to water and oxygen. And, and this is clearly not. All three of the methods that I showed up here don't meet that goal. We have to be able to uh, pull a sample out without exposing it to uh, the atmosphere. Um, the, the container here is certainly not where we want to be. That's something that would survive. I was pretty confident it would survive, survive 200 degree heat. Um, but um, the next time around, we'll probably try and see if we can do a better job of finding something to contain the sample. Um, and then, of course, my dream, instantaneous measurement. This is not. I've got to take this sample and go over to the other building and run it uh, through um, our, our machine. Well, so, so there's a lot of things left to do here, but uh, we've at least pulled a sample out and, and measured it, and we feel good about that first step. So here's the measurement part. I take the sample out, and we have to... Um, break the sample apart and dissolve it in some water. Again, I can't measure uh, impurities 
in the salt, if I'm gonna be dissolving that salt in the water, which is one of the impurities that I eventually like to measure. But for now, let's just see if we can measure some of the potential uh, corrosion products that might be in uh, steel. So uh, this is uh, an atomic absorption spectrometer. Um, it works with a flame, looks something like this. Uh, and that flame is back behind this door. Um, and this machine is set up to measure these uh, elements, uh, iron and chromium and manganese and nickel, which we might find in steel. Um, generally, it has uh, detection limits down below parts per million, so that, uh, that could work for us. Uh, one disadvantage for this machine, since it's an absorbance technique, it has to have a light source going through the sample, and the source has to have iron in the source if we want to measure iron in the sample. It has to have chromium in the source if you want to measure chromium in the sample, and so on. So you get the idea. If you want to measure anything on the periodic table, it gets to be a really bulky experiment. You got to have a lot of different things. You got to do the measurement a lot of different times. This is not where we want to be, but it's what I have in the room now, and so it's where we're going to start. So analytical chemists like straight lines. And so I tell my students to go in the lab and make me a calibration curve for each one of those metals. And uh, like good analytical chemists, they went in the lab and they made a solution of each one of these metals and they measured uh, the, the uh, this is the analytical signal absorbance, the log of absorbance versus concentration on the x-axis. And so uh, it's pretty decent straight lines and uh, down to uh, below parts per million range, that's good. No, that's bad. That's just in water, basically, some acid to make it dissolve. But uh, really, we're going to be looking into salts. And so what I need you to do is go back to the lab and make a solution of nitrate salts, really, really high concentration of nitrate salts, and do the experiment again. So I did it again. And again, four pretty nice straight lines down well past uh, parts per million range. And so that's a good start. Now let's see if we can measure uh, concentrations in the molten salt. Um, so we put the salt in the machine and we melt it and we pull out the first sample. This is before we pumped the sample. Uh, and we measured the iron and we measured the nickel and then we turn on the pump and it starts flowing. So now it's the salt going through the loop for the first time. We let that go for a while and uh, sample again. And uh, then we'll, lo and behold, the next time we pull sample out and measure it, uh, the iron and the nickel concentrations have gone up. Uh, it's too early for me to tell you if that's what we should expect or would expect, if it's uh, indicative of long-term corrosion. Really, all we just wanted to do was measure some samples out of the loop and see if uh, the samples seem to make sense. I don't know. It seems to make sense at this point. Certainly, we'll do this a lot more in the future. Well, um, so where do we want to go in the future? Uh, we, we really need to focus on the sampling from the loop without exposure to the atmosphere. That, that simply has to be done if we want to say anything about impurities in the salt. Um, we'd really like to be able to do analysis on the flowing loop. Uh, there's a, a long history of uh, electrochemistry and molten salts, and there may be some stuff we can learn from that, uh, and, and perhaps even do cyclic voltammetry in the flowing salt on the loop. Uh, there are certainly some other great techniques. I uh, mentioned the folks from Copenhagen Atomics using laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. There's a guy named Ammon Williams that published a paper last year uh, also with uh, LIBS, some really interesting work with molten salts. Uh, mass spectrometry, of course, is a great technique for uh, analyzing lots of different things. A uh, big challenge there, of course, is to uh, marry that to a, a system with flowing molten salt. And at this point, I don't know that that's been done but uh, it'd certainly be a, a great thing to look at. Well, my colleague, Dr. Robison, in the uh, uh, chemistry department um, is a physical chemist, and so he looks at the world a little bit differently. They're, oops, they're uh, working on characterization and purification of salts, and one of the tools that they use is differential scanning calorimetry. And so here is uh, some of the data from a differential scanning calorimeter for our dynaline molten salt. And so the x-axis here is temperature and the y-axis is the amount of energy that's being imparted to a very small sample, uh, five milligram or so sample of the dynaline salt. And for this particular run, we have a, a peak at about 129 degrees. That's sort of uh, the melting point of, of this uh, salt. But 
as they repeat this experiment over and over, they see that melting point change from a, a pretty broad range, 115 to 145 degrees. And maybe that's because as you look at the salt, it's not a great picture, but uh, what you see is that it's not homogeneous. There, there are larger particles, there are smaller particles. It makes me think that the company that we get this from mixes some solid lithium nitrate, some solid sodium nitrate, some solid potassium nitrate in a bucket and stirs it around. So it's mixed fairly well, but if you're only taking five milligram samples out, it probably is not a homogeneous sample. And so that would explain some of the uh, variance of the melting points that are observed there. Uh, some of the other work that uh, they've done with this kind of an instrument is to look at uh, the various um, behaviors of other mixtures. This is a fluoride salt with uh, three different components mixed in it. So this is a mole fraction on each one of these axes of a different component in the fluoride salt. And then they're looking at the melting point and so trying to find the uh, eutectic point down there for that particular mixture. Well, um, we have achieved crude sampling, very crude sampling and analysis of pumped flowing salt. That's something that we really wanted to check off our list so we can move on to something else uh, and, and improve that. Uh, we, we need vast improvements in sampling and certainly better analytical methods for more elements. Um, and so again, I, I continue to search for some direct analysis of the flowing molten salt that will enable us to tell everything or nearly everything that's in the salt in real time on your reactor sometime soon. These are the folks that have supported us. There's part of my research group there and I appreciate your kind attention. Questions? Um, I did some work on um, flame absorption spectroscopy and I know that iron as an element has um, a lot of wavelengths of absorption and therefore it was a necessity to get out the matrix in order to do proper analysis. Uh, did you have the same problem? We did uh, work with several, we looked at several wavelengths. Uh, there's not just one wavelength of course. So. So we looked at several wavelengths to find the wavelength that would be appropriate for each one of the metals that we looked at. Sometimes it wasn't always the, the default choice. So, so we've been using uh, Raman spectroscopy. That might be an interesting technique to teach the students and, and explore. Right, that would be great. It has a lot of possibilities and uh, certainly worth looking at. And if you need any basis for that, I'm actually producing you something else. Okay, I'll be glad to try one out for you. Let you know how it works. Let's thank the speaker again.